Uh, as Sharina mentioned, uh, um, I was with uh, ESRD for uh, 10 years and now started with the Alberta Energy Regulator. So I'm presenting a bunch of data and information from my days with uh, ESRD, um, but uh, I'm not kind of putting uh, an organization around uh, myself just because it, it is kind of uh, on my own uh, that I'm doing this now. So what I was going to talk about today was uh, nutrient budgets, just sort of what they are, what, what you can use them for, uh, what you might want to do it uh, at your own lake. Um, so what is a nutrient budget? It's basically an accounting system. I've got a figure here in a, in a second, but it's an accounting system for nutrients in the lake watershed. It tells you where nutrients are coming in from the lake watershed. Why is it important? Well, obviously, there's, there, we have a lot of nutrient-rich lakes, and we have issues with blue-green algae blooms. Um, and people are looking at, well, how do we control those? And, and really, the only way that we can effectively control uh, growth of blue-green algae is through nutrient control. So we need to know where our nutrients are coming from uh, so that we can start uh, controlling the, the amount of nutrients that are in the lake and that are uh, creating these uh, conditions that are favorable for, for blue-green algae growth. Um, it sets the current conditions so that we can then measure changes from uh, for future work. When when you start implementing your best management practices in the watershed or other uh, techniques to reducing nutrient concentrations, you want to have some way of measuring well how much have we reduced the nutrient input into a lake by. So that's also what the nutrient budget does, and it also identifies uh, areas of concern where where are the highest amount of nutrients coming from into uh, into the lake. Uh, so as I said, this, this kind of figure, uh, it, it, uh, it sort of gives you a good overview. Um, we get uh, nutrients coming in from rain, snow, from precipitation, as well as dust fall. We get it coming from cottage areas, we get it coming off of natural areas, we get it coming off of agricultural areas, uh, both direct uh, input as well as diffuse input. Um, we have sewage coming in, we have uh, groundwater uh, bringing in nutrients. And finally, and, and this is you know one of the more important parts of nutrient budgets in Alberta, or one of the, the large components of nutrient budgets in Alberta lakes is uh, is from the sediments. So you have a store of nutrients, nutrients are going into the lake and they sit in the sediments but they do get recycled back into the water over time as well. Um, so it is, it is an important component to uh, take account of. Um, when we kind of look at the conceptual ev evolution of a lake, and, and this is what happens over time when you have development around on the lakeshore. So initially you're going to have low external loading and, and low or no internal loading whatsoever. So any, anything that goes into the lake, it tends to go in and sink into the sediments. Early development, so when you first start uh, clearing a watershed uh, area, um, you're going to get an uh, increased amount of uh, nutrients coming into the lake. Um, Still, at that time, the, the lake sediment capacity is, is going to be large enough that it's going to just uh, act as a sink for that, uh, those nutrients coming into the lake and go into the sediments. You are going to have some uh, nutrients going out of the lake too by any of the outflows. Um, over time, things start to stabilize and, and uh, you, you have kind of your, your regular nutrient loading that's coming in from the watershed, uh, but you still have that store of nutrients in the, uh, in the lake sediments as well, and so you have nutrients coming out of the lake sediments as well into the lake as well as those nutrients coming in. And that's, this is kind of the situation where, where we're at uh, nowadays with most of our lakes is that you still have nutrients coming in from the watershed, you have nutrients coming in from the uh, lake sediments, um, and you have nutrients going out of the, the lake as well. Um, so ideally we want to reduce those external loadings potentially enhancing it with uh, reduced internal loading and there's, there's a few ways to do it. Um, I'll talk briefly about it to sort of towards the end. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that watershed development in uh, Alberta has been occurring since the 1800s. So this has been a long, long time process. One of the things really with, with any kind of nutrient management strategies, and we always try and emphasize this too, is that any nutrient management strategies, they do take time. It's not going to be something that can be fixed within a year. It's going to be multiple years, even decades, before you really start seeing uh, changes in nutrients. So it's, it's, kind, of a, it's kind of a down I guess in some ways uh, when, when you think oh okay well yeah, we can fix this problem within a couple of years but you got to remember that it's taken that long it's taken since the 1800s to get to the point of where we're at with some of our lakes it's going to take some time to uh, to fix them more or less um, 
here's what that uh, that figure that showed all the nutrient inputs what it basically looks like it's it's a very simple equation even though it might, it might look a little bit complex but you've got your inputs on the one side you subtract out your outputs um, and then you've got uh, your uh, lake sediment loading on there so the inputs uh, we have runoff going in so point and diffuse so that's from your streams as well as your overland runoff uh, atmospheric deposition which is your precipitation and dust fall uh, you have groundwater going in the sewage uh, uh, any kind of, uh, well, in terms of the, the outgoing stuff, you have diversions and you also have surface outflow that's going out. You also have groundwater that goes out as, as well. Um, and then finally, as I said, the, the lake sediment, um, which is either going into the sediments or being released from the sediments. What we also need for a uh, longer term nutrient budget is, is a water balance. So we need to know the quantity of water, like how much is, is uh, going in via, like say groundwater and stuff. You wanna know what the volume is of groundwater that's going into the lake as well as going out of the lake. So you need a, you need a, a fairly good wa water balance as well. Um, so we have our change in lake volume which is a reflection of the change in, in water volumes from runoff, direct atmosphere, precipitation and groundwater, um, minus out any of the water that's leaving the lake. So it's from groundwater going out, um, diversions, uh, surface outflow, so that's any of your outflows going out of the lake, as well as evaporation. We know that evaporation plays a, a big role in, uh, in influencing lake levels in, uh, in Alberta. So these, these are kind of the steps. I'm just gonna you know, sort of touch on these and, and uh, I'm using Pigeon Lake here as an example because it's the most recent lake where we've done the nutrient budget and I'm quite familiar with it. Um, just we've got the uh, report in, in through the publication process right now so we're just waiting for it to be released. Um, so if you're interested in that, you can look to there for, for more details. But even for those of you who are from lakes where they haven't done the nutrient budget at this point, it, it just sort of gives you an idea of what kind of information you're going to need to, to sort of complete that nutrient budget. So runoff. There, you can measure the runoff at direct stream input sources, so those are your, your streams that are going into the lake where you have that known uh, quantity. You can measure your quantity, you can measure the concentration of the nutrients going into the lake. Um, the loadings are calculated from the volume estimates as well as the concentration. So you take your volume and you take your concentration and that gives you a loading estimate, so the amount of kilograms of phosphorus per day going into the lake. Uh, you can estimate your diffuse runoff from the water balance as well as the land cover. So you use either uh, what we call runoff coefficients. So for different types of land type, we know how much water typically runs off of that type of land. Or you can get from uh, your direct stream data, so you get flow weight and mean concentration um, and uh, to estimate uh, how much is going in from diffuse runoff. Diffuse runoff is, is a little bit problematic. It's, it's a fairly large component that's going into the lake, but uh, for most of you, you know that diffuse can also be equivalent to sort of non-point source runoff. It's, it's really hard to estimate uh, exactly exactly how much is going into the lake. So we, all, we always just sort of uh, do an approximation for it. Uh, atmospheric deposition, you can measure this directly using your dry wet collectors uh, pr plus uh, precipitation data. Uh, or you can also estimate it using published Alberta li lake literature values. There, is, uh, there are some good papers out there that have um, uh, actual measurements and, and they seem to be relatively consistent across most of the province too. And, and combine that with the, your known uh, lake surface area. Uh, groundwater, you measure using your groundwater chemistry and your water balance. Uh, to, again, the water balance tells you how much groundwater is going in and the groundwater chemistry tells you, well, what's the concentration of your nutrients in that groundwater that's going in. Sewage, uh, this you can use your municipal census data for the, the residents living around the, the, in the watershed of the lake that you're interested in. You combine that with your literature value. We have a literature value here in Alberta of about 0.93 kilograms per person per year. You estimate your numbers of people per dwelling and then you estimate the percent failure rate of existing systems. We know that there are systems, and especially individual systems that are um, at properties around lakes, uh, there's about, we estimate about a 10% failure rate for those systems. We've done studies, there's, there's kind of caffeine studies in lakes and stuff where, um, where we've detected caffeine and we know that it's coming in from uh, faulty uh, septic systems. So we know that there is uh, a, a certain percentage failure rate of the, those systems. Um, and then the, the M, which is the uh, change in uh, phosphorus lake mass. 
we use a lake capacity curve so that tells you what the lake volume is at a specific elevation as well as the lake phosphorus concentration so then what we do to calculate the change in the phosphorus we say the change in total phosphorus concentration so when we just take a, sim a single sample and we have our phosphorus concentration we times it by our change in lake volume and that gives us our change in the total phosphorus mass uh, when, you, when you calculate it over two different dates so it tells you if you're, you're calculating out how much in the entire lake based on the volume of that lake as well as the phosphorus concentration an important thing to note of course is that for very large lake for very large lakes, if you have a very small change in lake total phosphorus, it can result in large changes in your total phosphorus estimates. So, I mean, we're taking one sample on one day uh, on a weekly basis, but we're, we're kind of scaling it up to the entire lake. And so, I mean, there's definitely a, a, a lot of potential error in that too. Um, so it's something to, to sort of keep in mind when you're working through, if you're ever working through one of these phosphorus budgets. Uh, so this is Pigeon Lake. One of the other things that's important for when you're when you're looking at the lake, again, this is uh, relating to sort of that diffuse runoff and knowing what your land types are and what your typical um, nutrient concentrations coming off of different light land types is, is to, to have a, a, a land cover uh, map for your watershed so that you know exactly, okay, well, we've got this much percentage of uh, perennial crops, we've got this much percentage of annual crops, this much percentage of exposed lands, and so forth. Um, this is just again just sort of a demonstration this is for Pigeon Lake what we measured in uh, 2013 so this is total phosphorus concentrations at each of the uh, streams the inflowing streams uh, going into the lake so it sort of shows you this is actually a pretty typical pattern that we see um, I was working with Dave True on, on this as well and, and he plotted out uh, Baptiste Lake or he'd done this work back in the, the 19 uh, early 1980s and a very similar pattern you get a, a fairly high runoff uh, fairly high concentrations of phosphorus going into like early in the spring season then it tends to level out these little peaks that we sort of see in here um, are related to uh, summer storm events so you get a big rain event washes a whole bunch of stuff into those streams and goes into the lake uh, these, this is sort of our, our discharge again you can see in the springtime you get uh, the fairly high discharge uh, and then you get the little peaks in the summertime uh, you can see in this case here the outflow on, on Pigeon Lake was uh, fairly significant in, in terms of the, uh, the discharge uh, we can calculate out the cumulative discharge so this is how much water went into the lake through each of those individual streams over the course of the entire open water season and, and it gives you what uh, the amount of water going in um, Cumulative, cumulatively and so from that we can calculate either our instantaneous total phosphorus loads so how much kilograms per day we have or we can have kilograms over that entire open season to, to be able to compare all the different uh, streams so we can see in this case that a lot of phosphorus went out from the outflow but I mean each of these are inflows and so each of these are contributing phosphorus into the lake as well uh, this is uh, just sort of that demonstration of uh, using the Pigeon Lake capacity curve. So this is the levels that we had for Pigeon Lake uh, on each of the sampling dates over the course of the season, as well as the total phosphorus concentrations. And as I said, you, you sort of multiply the, the two of them to get your overall phosphorus in terms of kilograms in the lake, and you can calculate the change from day to day. You can see even you know on Pigeon Lake that it starts fairly low, but it does it does tend to increase over over time. So when you do all your calculations, this again, I don't want people to focus, focus too much on it, but it, it just sort of shows you uh, for that phosphorus term budget, so that first equation I showed you, it shows you each one of the different terms and how much phosphorus is, again in this case is uh, for Pigeon Lake, so this is all the phosphorus that's going in as well as the phosphorus that's going out, and then we get our, our net internal loading as well uh, that's coming into the lake. Uh, here's what it looks like on, on a pie chart. So this is split purely between the, the internal loading as well as the external through the watershed. So you see about uh, just over half of the, the uh, phosphorus on an annual basis is coming in from the lake sediments. The rest of it was coming in from the watershed. Um, again, the internal large loading. So we get uh, you know almost uh, over 50% of it coming in from uh, from the uh, the sediments itself. Uh, runoff contributes from the external, so from the watershed itself, we get uh, the largest contributions from runoff as well as uh, dust fall and precipitation. Uh, we do have some contribution from sewage as well as uh, from groundwater as well. 
I'm just going to flip through here. These, these are other lakes that we've done here in the province. There's about, I think, 10 or 11 lakes that we've done nutrient budgets for. But the, the interesting thing that you'll note on here is that, uh, that you know, there, there's fairly large contributions from, from the watershed in terms of, uh, like, from diffuse runoff and precipitation and stuff. But the biggest contribution in most of our lakes in Alberta, in central Alberta, is from uh, internal uh, loading. Uh, it doesn't completely show on here, but yeah, this, this fraction here is from the, the internal loading. Uh, again, this is for Wadman Lake, about 67% was from internal loading, Tucker Lake, 59%, uh, Pine Lake here, 60% of it was from internal loading, around 60% for Isle Lake, Lac St. Anne, 52%, Gull Lake, about 48%. So all about like half, uh, half of the, the nutrient loading on an annual basis is coming from uh, the, the sediment. So it is, it is an important source. It is something that, uh, that does need to be considered. Obviously, watershed management is the, the priority um, for, for a number of reasons. First of all, you're controlling the source when you're doing watershed management. Um, Secondly, um, it, it does contribute a, you know, a, a significant amount of uh, nutrients uh, going into the lake. And, and finally, it's, it's often the cheapest and easiest uh, method to pursue. Doing in-lake management, you're talking about direct manipulation on a lake. It requires a lot of permitting in a lot of cases, uh, and it requires a huge investment in terms of uh, time and money as well to, to look at it. We're not saying that you should not ever look at in-lake management. I mean, we do have examples here in Alberta. Pine Lake is a good example where we do have in-lake management. But again, just to, sort of keep those things in mind when you're trying to look at these things. Um, so in conclusion, to effectively manage nutrients, the source of nutrients, we need to know where, where they're coming from. Uh, phosphorus budgets, they do require an extensive investment in time and funds and significant data. We have about, as I said, about 11 lakes, I think, here in Alberta where we've done detailed nutrient budgets on it. It's, and having gone through it with Pigeon Lake, it's a huge investment in time and money. Um, we've sampled like hundreds of lakes across Alberta, but we've only done that for, for 11 lakes. The interesting thing, again, as I said, is that the, uh, the phosphorus budgets are, are fairly similar in uh, many, many of the cases. So uh, before you start throwing in or throwing like thousands of dollars at uh, developing a nutrient budget for your lake. Consider developing a desktop method using long-term water balance data. If you, if you talk nicely to the hydrologist and they can give you that long-term water balance, you can do a lot with it and you can do a lot of uh, good estimates in terms of uh, where, where your nutrients are coming from in, uh, in the watershed or potentially coming from in the watershed. Um, again, significant internal loads, but we do need to do that watershed source management. Without managing source, you're just going to continue to load up the lake with the, with the nutrients. Uh, again, about half your nutrients are still coming from the watershed. So if you don't control those nutrients, then controlling the nutrients in the lake that's coming from the sediments is really not going to, to make any gains. It's just going to load itself back up again. Um, but having said that, uh, additional benefits may be realized through in-lake management. You, you have to do some careful planning. In-lake management is time consuming, it's costly, and it can have significant environmental implications. So you really need to be careful when you're going through and, and doing uh, any consideration of in-lake uh, in uh, management. And I think that's it. Yep.